Hey guys, it's Abby. Welcome back to my channel. It has been such a long time since I have filmed a video. Almost two years, which is crazy to me that it's been that long. But I am back and I am so, so excited to sit down and talk with you guys again. Today's video is going to be different than all the content that I have been previously posting. I'm going to film a little get ready with me and go more in depth on why I'm switching up my content. But today's video is going to be a true crime video. True crime is something that I am super interested in and today's case is something that absolutely blows my mind. In my opinion, he is one of the scariest serial killers for many reasons, which we will get into, but he also fascinates me to no end because of the amount of murders he got away with in such a short amount of time and the way he did them. Now, with that being said, today's video is about Richard Ramirez, aka The Night Stalker. As I've been doing all the research for this case to film this video, it has honestly freaked me out because I now live in Los Angeles, which is where all of these murders took place not too terribly long ago. Before I get into the video, I do want to say that me telling this story and the other stories that I will be getting into in future videos, I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone involved, any of the victims, any of the families of the victims, anyone who was affected by these atrocious acts. Um, I'm simply just sharing the facts for all of you who may also be interested in learning about these kinds of things just like I am. <laughs> Like I mentioned, today's video is about Richard Ramirez, aka The Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez was born on February 29th, 1960 in El Paso, Texas. Now, he did not have the best home life growing up, which we see time and time again. It is something that shows up in pretty much every serial killer that we see, or just crazy murderer, is that they typically did not have a good home life, which was the case for Richard Ramirez. Not an excuse whatsoever, but a lot of people, especially psychologists, believe that these things, especially in early childhood development, play a huge factor in how these people come to be the killers that they are. Richard even said this himself once during an interview. A serial killer comes about by circumstances and like a, a recipe, poverty, drugs, child abuse, these things, you know, are, contribute to a person, uh, to a person's frustration and anger, and uh, and uh, at a, some point in life, he explodes. Another thing that many people believe contributed to the way his mind just was that made him feel like it was okay and made him enjoy doing these unspeakable things was the fact that he had two head injuries as a child. This is just another pattern that we do tend to see in serial killers. Richard's head injuries were actually so bad that they did cause a seizure disorder. Now the seizure disorder did go away on its own as he got a little bit older, but for a while he did have a large amount of epileptic fits because of those head injuries he had. At age 12, Richard began smoking weed with his cousin Miguel, who was a horrible influence on him. He had just recently gotten back from fighting in the Vietnam War and had terrible terrible PTSD. However, that is not to say that he was a good person before going to the war. He frequently showed Richard pictures of him raping and murdering Vietnamese women, which is probably not the best thing to be seeing at the impressionable age of 12, but you know. Along with that, Miguel also told him how to properly kill somebody. Another thing that probably should not be talked about with a 12 year old. At 13, Richard was over at Miguel's house one day and Miguel got in a massive fight with his wife. He ended up pulling out a gun and shooting her, which resulted in her dying. Miguel actually was not sent to jail for this. He was found guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced to, in my opinion, not a long enough time in a mental hospital before being released. Around this time, Richard also began experimenting with drugs such as LSD and meth, which as I keep saying, but like this is really just a recipe for disaster with such a young kid taking these drugs that are affecting his developing brain, hearing all of these things, witnessing these things, it's genuinely like a recipe for disaster. And it was kind of just like a downhill slope into what Richard eventually turned into later on in life. He later ended up moving in with his sister and his sister's wife, who was actually kind of a creep. Um, he taught Richard how to sneak up to women's houses and secretly watch them, changing, showering, even just doing day-to-day -day things. He was a creepy, creepy guy, and he taught Richard this at 
yet again a young age which no matter what age you are you really shouldn't teach people that or do that but Richard ended up dropping out of school in the ninth grade and at age 17 he got a job at a Holiday Inn. One thing he loved to do while working at this Holiday Inn was he would take his master key card and use it to break into rooms and steal their valuables. One night Richard decided to get a little bit ballsy and decided to attempt to tie up a woman and rape her. Thankfully the woman's husband came in just in time and caught Richard in the act and was able to stop him before he actually was able to do anything but the couple did not end up pressing charges. They were at first, but then they dropped the charges because they just felt like they couldn't go back to Texas and relive the whole incident, being in court and whatnot. So Richard got away scot-free, except for losing his job, of course. In 1997, Richard was arrested for the first time. It was for marijuana possession. Shortly thereafter, he moved to California, where he developed an interest in Satanism and was arrested twice more in 1981 and 1984 for auto theft. Now here is where we get into the murders. There are 14 murders that have been traced back to him, as well as plenty of people that he's tortured and raped and horrible things. So he has done quite a lot of things, so I'm going to not go into incredible detail with all of them because there are so many. All of his murders took place in 1984 and 1985, the majority being in 1985. Richard's first murder was in April of 1984, and this murder was actually not attributed to him until 2009. This was the murder of nine-year-old Mae Young, who was beaten, raped, then stabbed to death and he hung her body from a pipe, which her brother ended up finding later on. The next murder happened on June 28, 1984. His second victim was 79-year-old Jenny Winkow, who was sexually assaulted and then stabbed to death. He also stole a few of her items in the process. After this, it was nine months later before he struck again. It was on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day of 1985. Now, this one is quite interesting actually. He attempted to shoot and kill Maria Hernandez, but just as he fired the gun, she instinctively put her hand up to block her face. She had keys in her hand at the time, and the bullet bounced off of the keys and did not hurt her, which is incredible that that managed to happen. And as you can imagine, Richard was quite shocked by this. He then, however, went inside and killed her roommate, Dale Okazaki. She was hiding behind the countertop when she heard all the commotion outside. And when Richard came in, she had peeked her head just above the countertop to see what was going on, to see if the coast was clear. And that's when he saw her and unfortunately shot her. Maria Hernandez, because she was able to block the bullet, she was fine. However, I'm honestly not quite sure why he didn't go back after her again because he knew that she was fine but she begged with him not to hurt her and he didn't apparently that did not satisfy his appetite for action for the night because later that night he goes on to pull Sai Lian Yu out of her car while she's driving and shoots and kills her people aren't exactly sure if his intention was just to kill her or if it was an attempt to steal the car as well um, but he didn't end up taking the car, so my thoughts are probably that it was just another victim that he thought was perfect for him, apparently. After these two murders, the media kind of went crazy and ended up calling him the Valley Intruder. However, that nickname obviously didn't stick, as we all know him now as the Night Stalker. Just 10 days later, on March 27th, Richard broke into the home of 64-year-old Vincent Zazara and his 44-year-old wife, Maxine Zazara. When she saw Richard in the home, she attempted to grab a gun and shoot him, but unfortunately the gun was not loaded. This obviously angered Richard. He then shot her husband and followed it up by brutally assaulting her and stabbing her to death. Not only did he do this, but he took out her eyeballs and took them home with him in one of her own jewelry boxes, which I can't even imagine walking around with a jewelry box with just like two human eyeballs rolling around in it. Oh my god. This murder, however, is the first murder that Richard actually left evidence at. He left a footprint in the garden, which police were able to make a mold of and save for later. It was also at this point that they realized they had a serial killer on their hands because they were able to match up the bullets from this murder with the other previous murders, so they knew it was coming from the same gun. He went on for two more months without any more murders, but started back up again with the murder of 66-year-old Harold Wu and his wife, 
who was 63 year old Jean Wu. He shot Harold in the head and then proceeded to bind up Jean and brutally rape her. But for some reason, he did let her live. So at this point, we do have a few eyewitnesses who were able to describe what he looked like. And one thing that all of these people said was that he had horrible teeth and his breath smelled like death. On May 29th, he attacked 83 year old, I, I'm sorry, I don't really know how to pronounce this name. I believe it's Malviel Keller and her disabled 80 year old sister, Blanche Wolf. He beat both of them with a hammer and attempted to rape Malviel, but did not succeed. He then took a red lipstick and drew a pentagram on her thighs. Blanche, however, did survive. The next day, 41 year old Ruth Wilson was bound and raped by Richard while her 12 year old son was locked in a closet. He then slashed her once with a knife, tied her up to her son and left them both alive. Now we get to June and July, which are his busiest months. On July 5th, a 16 year old girl named Whitney Bennett was beaten by Richard with a tire iron and thankfully did survive. However, the brooding was so bad that she has spent many years since then getting reconstructive surgery just to fix her face since the attack, which is incredibly sad. On July 7th, 63 year old Linda Fortuna was attacked by Richard. He attempted to rape her but did not succeed. On July 20th, he shot and killed a 32 year old man, Chit chat. I'm so sorry if I'm butchering this last name, Aswahem, and then proceeded to beat and sexually assault his 29-year-old wife, Sakima. Later that same day, 66-year-old Layla and Maxon Needing were both shot and he mutilated their corpses. On August 6th, he shot 38-year-old Christopher Peterson and his 27-year-old wife, Virginia. They both thankfully did survive this attack, which again only adds to more and more eyewitnesses. So at this point, there are quite a few people who have seen him and are able to give a detailed description of what he looks like. Richard then ended up leaving Los Angeles and headed to San Francisco on August 17th. When he was there, he shot a 66 year old man who ended up unfortunately passing away and he also beat the man's wife and shot her as well. She ended up surviving and because of the eyewitnesses and the police sketches, she was able to identify her attacker as the one known as the Valley Intruder. After this, however, the media redubbed him the Night Stalker. On August 24th, Richard traveled 50 miles south of Los Angeles and broke into the apartment of 29-year-old Bill Carnes and his 27-year-old fiance, Inez Erickson. He shot Bill in the head and then proceeded to rape Inez before demanding that she swear her love to Satan. He then tied her up and left her alive, but she was able to make her way to the window just as he was leaving, saw what car he drove off in, and was able to even get a partial plate number, which is incredible and helped out so much in tracking him down. They were able to connect these murders in San Francisco back to all of the murders that were happening in Los Angeles. So the San Francisco Police Department and the Los Angeles Police Department were able to get in contact with each other and discuss and they realized that the killer had moved on to San Francisco, at least temporarily. However, once this was found out and the LAPD shared their information with the San Francisco Police Department, the governor immediately went and did a press release and gave out every single bit of information that the police had, which completely, honestly, like that irritates me so much because when it comes to these things, police may release little bits and pieces of information they have, but the majority of the time they have so much information that nobody in the public knows about because they don't want the killer to know that they know these things. Because if the killer knows these things, they'll be like, oh, I'm getting sloppy. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to change it up because they're catching on to me. And this is exactly what she did. There were a few other instances where he had left footprints in crime scenes and they were able to track down his specific shoe, which actually was not a very common shoe, which this was one thing that was helping them easily connect one murder to another based off of the footprint until the governor announced that they had the specific footprint and the type of shoe and Richard proceeded to then go to the Golden Gate Bridge and toss them off and now they no longer had that which I can't even imagine how frustrating that would be to sit there and see her spill all of those secrets all of those things that they had been collecting bit by bit to finally catch this man and she just on August 28th, the police were able to track down the car, which, shocker, was stolen. It was completely wiped down, except for one single fingerprint, which the police were able to put into the database and found out that it was none other than Richard Ramirez. Two days later, they ended up releasing his mugshots. They had them everywhere. They had them in the newspapers. They had them 
up places, and coincidentally enough, Richard had left town right before they put his mugshot up. He had no idea about this. He decided to take a bus to Arizona to visit his brother right before this. He gets there and his brother is not home or not available, whatever the case may be. He doesn't end up seeing his brother, so he takes the bus back to Los Angeles. In the meantime, during this whole bus trip out there and bus trip back is when the police put out his mugshot. So there are police everywhere at the bus station waiting because they're assuming Richard is going to try to make a break for it and leave. Little did they know, he already left. So while the police are there waiting and they're looking for Richard to get on a bus to leave, Richard is coming back from Arizona with not a clue in the world as to what's been happening. So they don't see him get on the bus. He then sees all these police and while he doesn't know that they're there for him, he thinks, wow, this isn't good, there's a lot of police and I'm a serial killer. So he goes out the back entrance and the police have no idea that he's even there because they're looking in the wrong spot. Richard then ends up running into these two older ladies and they start whispering to each other. And that's when he sees his picture on a newspaper. These two ladies are whispering and saying, that's him, that's the guy. And obviously, because he realizes the jig is up, like people know who I am and my picture is everywhere on all of these newspapers, he takes off. He just starts running. He then tries to steal a car to get away, and that's when people spot him and realize that this is the killer. He then says that he has a gun and demands that the man get out of the car so he can take it. I don't believe that he had a gun because at no point did he ever use it, but some other man walks up and decides to just whack him over the head with a pole. That's it. Just whacks him over the head with a pole and starts beating him. Then this whole neighborhood literally gangs up on Richard. He takes off again. He starts jumping fences like as if it were a movie. He is just running, doing everything he can to avoid these people who are chasing him. Eventually they catch up to him and they literally like beat the shit out of him. And they're holding him down. They call the police and the police show up and they see this massive commotion. They see this guy on the side of the street. He has all these injuries. They actually had to call the paramedics to attend to him at the scene because they beat him up so bad, which I mean, good for them. Teamwork. I mean, I just, I think that's like my favorite part of this whole thing is how one community just came together. This is like a literal serial killer like a dangerous man. And this whole community just has no fear. They just take off and capture the serial killer. Now, when it came to the trial, choosing a jury was very, very difficult because obviously this is a massive serial killer who was tormenting the city of Los Angeles for a year. Everyone knew the Night Stalker in the area and even across the country. So many people knew about him. So it was very hard to find a jury that knew little about the case and would be as unbiased as possible. This was actually one of the most expensive trials in American history other than the O.J. Simpson trial. On August 3rd, 1988, a jail employee overheard Ramirez planning to try and smuggle a gun into the courtroom to shoot the prosecutor. Because of this, they ended up placing metal detectors outside the doors and no gun was ever smuggled in. No one's really sure if that was actually going to happen or not, but it's just what someone who worked at the jail overheard so they did take precautionary measures. Richard also had quite a few fans. Even still today, there is kind of a phenomenon. Um, I think a lot of people know more so with Ted Bundy, where people are just fascinated by serial killers and feel like they're in love with them and they can help change them, which is not, no. Everyone makes him look so bad, you know, but I know that he's, He's a nice person because I've met him and I know. He's convicted of 13 murders. I know. <laughs> but yeah, so Richard had a lot of adoring fans and one of these was actually on the jury and she was eventually dismissed after being inappropriate and showing bias in favor of Richard. One of these fans actually ended up marrying Richard. Her name is Doreen Leoy, and she wrote him 75 letters while he was incarcerated. They ended up getting married. He proposed in 1988, and they got married on October 3rd of 1989 in California's San Quentin State Prison. They were not together up until his death, but before that she did make a statement saying that she would commit suicide the day Richard was put to death. A little crazy if you ask me. On August 14th, there was a little bit of a hiccup in the trial because one of the jurors, Phyllis Singletary, was found shot to death in her apartment after she didn't show up for jury duty. People were then terrified, especially the members of the jury, and rightfully so, because if I were them, I probably also would have thought it was Richard. As it turned out, it was her boyfriend who they later found had committed suicide with the same gun in a hotel room. 
but the woman who replaced Phyllis on the jury was absolutely terrified that the same thing would happen to her. On September 20th, 1989, Richard Ramirez was found guilty. And let me read all of this from my phone for a second because it's a lot. He was found guilty of 13 counts of murder because keep in mind, he was not connected to the death of Mei Lung until 2009. So it is now 14 now that they know that, but at the time in 1989, they only charged him with 13 counts of murder. So 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. On November 7th, um, 1989, they ended up sen sentencing him to death in California's gas chambers, which I didn't even know was a way to put people to death. While on death row, Richard appealed numerous times and none of them actually ended up having time to go through before he passed away on his own because the court transcripts were a couple thousand pages long. After 24 years on death row, Richard Ramirez died of complications from B-cell lymphoma at the age of 53 on June 7th, 2013. It's believed that he probably would have been on death row until somewhere in his 80s with all of the appeals and all of just the craziness of his case. In general, they do accept a lot of appeals and it takes a lot of consideration to put someone on death row in the unfortunate circumstance that the person isn't actually guilty. In Richard's case, he was most definitely guilty, but they do do that process just because there have been occasions where someone was put to death and they found that they were not actually guilty, which in my opinion, why I don't think that the death penalty should be a thing because of those instances. But because of that, yeah, Richard would have spent at least another 30 years on death row. But yeah, that is the story of the Night Stalker. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I am, again, so fascinated by true crime. I want to do so many more videos just like this, but I want to know what cases you guys want to see. So feel free to DM me on Instagram. I will leave my links down below. Feel free to leave a comment, and I will try to research and make a video on whatever case you want. Obviously, this is a super, super well-known case, but I would really love to be able to use this to help other people as well. I would love to share cases that aren't as well known even more recent cases where they're still looking for someone I would love to tell those stories and hopefully get more people to be able to hear about it so if nothing else they can just keep an eye out or be able to tell their friends who may have somehow seen something or may know something or may be able to help in any way so let me know any cases you want to see I'm also going to be doing a little conspiracy and supernatural kind of content which i will talk more about in the get ready with me video that i mentioned i will be filming soon but if you have any ideas for that as well let me know those too because i would love to research it and talk about it with you guys i don't know if i already said this but thank you so 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 much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video if you did please give it a thumbs up and if you're not already be sure to subscribe so you can see my new true crime videos as they come out again probably for the third time thank you so much for watching and i will see you in my next one bye